Hello and welcome back to the lecture on Applied Econometrics. We have been talking about instrumental variables. And in this lecture, we are going to talk about a particular type of problem that we often come across quantitative economics research problem and that we call problem of endogeneity. Now, before I begin, let me tell you that sometimes endogeneity is construed as something like reverse causality, but that is not true. And we'll see endogeneity can come from various sources. And there is under the broad rubric endogeneity, we can club all these problems together. Now, to explain the endogeneity, uh, we will say that whenever we see a condition something like this, let's say expectation uh, or let's say covariance of xi ui is not equal to zero, we say there is a problem of endogeneity. Now we have seen this before, uh, particularly for a stochastic regressor, that covariance of xi ui may not be zero if the xi and ui are correlated, and that is why we had to have specific condition for a stochastic regressor, a specific Gauss Markov assumption we had to satisfy for stochastic regressor and that was expectation of ui given xi is equal to 0. Now whenever to simplify our definition, whenever we see a, this condition to exist, we call there is a problem of endogeneity. Whenever we have this problem, covariance xi ui is not equal to 0, we say that there is a problem of endogeneity. Now, we have already seen this problem to be existing in different occasions. And one such occasion is omitted variable bias. And I'm just going to outline the different sources where from endogeneity may come. And in all these different sources, we will have this particular criteria uh, visible. Okay, So we'll see covariance of xi ui is not equal to 0. And one such occasion is omitted variable bias and what happens in case of omitted variable bias we know that let's say there is a there is a one important variable which is let's say let's say my regression equation is this it's alpha 1 alpha 2 x2 and u let's say some uh, you know important regressor is missed out and that regressor x3 is influencing a part of it is influencing x2 and also u now what happens is that because it is omitted and a part of it is actually influencing x2 and a part of it is influencing u, so what happens is that we will see that x2 and u are not independent. So we will see this particular formula, the particular relation to hold in case of omitted variable bias. And whenever we have such criteria fulfilled, we call that there is a problem of endogeneity which is do not want, which we do not want. We need to actually get rid of this problem. But we will see how we can get rid of problem. Uh, but before that, let me actually outline all the different sources of this um, endogeneity. Now, the second problem we already spoke about is a measurement error. It's a measurement error. What is a measurement error? Measurement error occurs when we do not have the right variable uh, for our model. So let's say we want to measure IQ, but we do not have any data on IQ or talent. So what we do, we actually use education as a proxy. Now, the proxy often is not the perfect proxy. And if we do not have a perfect proxy, we have seen that it might be a problem. Because for, if we have an ideal proxy, which is really good, we do not have any problem. We can use an ideal proxy. But in most of the cases, it is very, very difficult to get an ideal proxy. And we use an imperfect proxy. And when you use an imperfect proxy, we actually see this condition to be there relation to exists. So covariance xi ui is not equal to zero and we call that the endogeneity problem occurs when we have measurement error. Now in this lecture, so these two problems we have already, you know, already sort of we are familiar with. I will talk about the third and the fourth source of endogeneity. Okay, and third source, let me use a new page, the third source is the pro is selection bias. The third source of endogeneity is selection bias. Now what is the selection bias? I will actually explain that with an example. Let's say in our, let's say this is a school of management and all the students have come here for their MBA and they do their regular MBA course and then they go and go out in the job market and then they bag all these consulting and investment banking jobs and so forth. Now let's say, uh, you know, realizing that programming language, knowledge in programming language is really, really important. Uh, so perhaps let's say in our business school, we have actually started a programming language course. Let's say we are offering Python, C, C++ or something. Now, now let's say we have started that back in 
you know, 2018, and today we want to actually see if our program has actually yielded any result because we have to take a call whether we want to continue that program or not. Now, what do you do? We see the, the cohort, the batch, which has gone to the labor market and they're basically there for last three years. And let's say we see the, the wage difference between the group who took that programming course and vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the group who did not. Now, if I compare that, let's say I actually have found that the group which took the programming course actually have gotten a better a better uh, return from the labor market. Okay, so their wages are higher. Let's say the group with the group with the programming language. So this is a treatment variable. Programming has got a better wage with a group without programming. Now, is this comparison fair? That is the first question. This comparison is not actually fair. And the reason is, in, in all likelihood, it is not fair. And the reason is that when we had, let's say, this is our group of students. Okay, this is our group of students, all our students. And some students will select the programming course. Some students will not select the programming course. Let's say it is given voluntarily. Students can choose which program, which one they want to attend. Let's say they want to attend the programming, and let's say this group, this group, this green group. Let's say they have actually gone for the programming course, and the remaining blue they did not go for the programming course. Now, it can so happen that, and it is in all likelihood that might be the case that all the students who actually took that programming course, despite the rigor and hard work that is needed for to complete complete their regular MBA course. These guys can actually be really hardworking, and they are actually like per, perhaps they're more drive and they are they're more sort of you know eager to get success, or they are they're actually you know they're smart enough to get all these thing, things done, and they can actually learn programming language alongside their regular MBA curricula. So they will in inherently invariably they are going to do better in the labor market because they have so and so criteria, right? Then there's so so and so traits. So essentially, when we we so if this group, this green group, actually self-selecting themselves into the treatment, okay, this treatment here, and this green group is actually self-selecting. They are selecting themselves, okay, to this treatment. Now, because of this, the comparison here is not really with apple and orange. Uh, is not really apple and apple, but it is basically a comparison of apple and orange. You can say, okay, apple and orange. We do not want that, and we'll see when we we actually use some technical randomization to actually get rid of this self selection. But uh, this can be a problem in in uh, you know this is a problem in economics wherever we do experimental research or even with observational data the self selection problem could be there, and we can either randomize and also instrumental variable could be an important tool to actually get rid of the self selection problem, and we'll talk about it. Now the last source of endogeneity, the last source of endogeneity is reverse causality. And that is something, again, very, very close to the heart of an econometrician. Reverse causality. Reverse causality. So let us talk about reverse causality. Reverse causality, so basically when we see the relationship between y and x, essentially what we see, let's say there is a y and there is x. So in a regression equation, we always try to understand the impact of x on y. This is what we try to understand. But in many instances, we'll see that actually, actually there is a link, or there is an influence that is operating between y to x. Okay, so x is not really independent here or exogenous here. I, I'll explain the term exogenous, but rather it's an endogenous variable. We'll just talk about endogenous and exogenous variable, but here, uh, just note that the causality there is a there is a circularity here. So let me give you an example to illustrate this. So let's say that the so let's say the child labor case. So there are many families in India or any other poor countries where the you know children uh, if if it is a poor family, what happens is and if they have many kids, let's say one kid actually joins in the labor market and they they do some work to sort of add to the family income. So that is not completely unknown it is it is rather common phenomena 
Now, if, if let's say I want to actually build a model around participation in labor force uh, of the child labors, okay? So let's say I write child labor is my dependent variable. And in my independent variable, let's say I have, now why people will join, why the children from families will join labor force? So one reason of course is that the family income, alpha two into family income, so if the family income is less, it is likely that they, the kids will actually join the labor market. The next point could be alpha three number of number of children. Okay, so if a family has a lot of children, usually, and they're poor, so some of the kids may actually go for the labor market. Particularly, the elder one might actually go go to the labor market. Then there could be something like mother's education. So if the mother is educated, she might actually resist the children from joining the labor force. Okay, so mother's education, mother's education. And let's say I have some error card. Okay, let me reduce the size a little bit. And let's have some error card. Now, we can understand if the relationship between all these variables. So let us particularly look at this particular two variables. So child labor participation and family income. So if family income is less, I can convincingly argue that there is a possibility that one or two kids from the family may join in the labor market. Now, could there be a case where participation in labor market child participant in the labor market may actually add to the family income. And we'll see actually that is the case because if a kid is actually joining the labor market and he's, he or she is usually doing that because he or she wants to actually add to family income, so the moment a kid is you know participating in the labor market that might actually increase the family income. Okay, So I can write this equation as family income is equal to that side is beta beta 2, let's say we have all these different variables, father's education, then I have father's, let's say, father's income, or father's employment status, and then I'll also have, let's say, child labor, and there can be, there can be a a whole lot of other factors, but child labor could also be a factor here. Now, essentially that is what we call, that is what we call the problem of endogeneity. So child labor is influencing family income, whereas family income is influencing child labor. So they're, in, in true sense, they're not really independent, they're not really exogenous. And I'll explain this term, exogenous and endogenous. So here, what you see is that this variable, this child labor, variable and the family income variable, they're not really, they're not really, uh, they're actually getting determined by the model. So that because they're determined by the model, so I will tell that them as endogenous variable, endogenous variable, endogenous variable. But there could be some other factor which are not determined by the model, but let's say given from outside and that could be exogenous variable. We'll talk more about this endogenous variable and exogenous variable uh, going forward. But essentially, this is the idea of reverse causality. And when we have reverse causality, the beta 2, uh, B2 uh, OLS estimate of beta 2 is actually, is actually, is actually, is actually wrong or in the sense it is biased. Okay, so when it is biased, it is not B2LS is not equal to beta 2 and it is inconsistent. So what it, what inconsistency means if n tends to infinity, B2OLS does not converge to beta 2, does not converge to beta 2, so which we do not want. We want as n tends to infinity, B2OLS should converge to beta 2. But we'll see that is not the case. Now, then essentially we talked about all these four problems now, the omitted variable bias, measurement error, selection bias, and reverse causality. So all these four problems comes under the rubric of endo endogeneity problem. And we will see that instrumental variable can actually play an instrumental role in actually addressing this endogeneity problem, uh, you know, uh, irrespective of whichever source they're coming from. Of course, there are a lot of, you know, care that you need to take while choosing an instrument, but uh, actually, uh, theoretically, instrumental variable can actually uh, address all these problems, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So essentially what happened, 
you know, uh, when we talked at the beginning of the lecture that uh, usually uh, people are shy when we talk about causality and statisticians and econometricians, there, there is a little difference uh, between two disciplines. The econometricians also build their statistical tool over a period of time and instrumental variable is one of those uh, monumental contribution that econometricians have made in this domain. And essentially, econometricians are more vocal about causality because economics, the we, we need to, we, we just not, we just don't need to build tools, but we rather need to solve problems. We, need, we rather need to understand the causal linkages. And that is why econometricians have always been obsessed with causality. And that is why we have actually come up with different, you know, weapons in our arsenal. And one such uh, weapon is instrumental variable. Now, the reason I spoke about all these different problems is that actually using instrumental variable, we can address uh, these problems, basically, the problem that we spoken at the beginning, that is the, the covariance of xi, ui, not equal to zero. So this particular problem, when it is there, which is basically common for all these uh, four cases, so we will see that instrumental variable can actually help us to get rid of this particular condition. So with this, we end this lecture here. Thank you.